Like other early Nornithischians, Culindodromius was a plant-eating bipedal runner. While most other ornithischian dinosaurs have been described from bones, extra fossils were available for Culindodromius, and these revealed a startling revelation, it had a body that was covered in feathers. These feathers seem to have created a downy fluff covering that grew over most of the body, the only exceptions being the tail and lower legs. Othnelia has become regarded as a dubious dinosaur genus, since all of the good fossil material that was once labeled as Othnelia has gone into creating Othnealosaurus and the holotype might have been juvenile. Evidence that it was not fully grown include its small size, unfused neural arches, and the ends of its long bones are spongy and incompletely formed. The skeleton itself is about one-third the size of a known adult specimen. Orictodromius individuals were found buried within the remains of an underground den or burrow. The skeletons were densely packed and disarticulated, indicating that the animals died and decayed within the burrow. These evidences show it might have been digger dinosaur. With surprisingly thick ribs and limb bones, this Scolosaurus was sturdily constructed and clearly lacked an affinity for speed. The genus attracted media attention in 2000, when a specimen was interpreted as including a fossilized heart. However, many scientists now doubt the identification of the object. Hypsilophodon had a pretty simple plant-based diet. It probably lived off of the indigenous plants of the time which would have included conifers and ferns, but it may have supplemented its diet with insects. It had long legs that were very flexible and capable of giving this dinosaur the speed it needed to evade predators and a long tail that could be used to balance itself. While most Leelinosaura pictures show these dinosaurs with lizard-like skin, the truth is they probably either had fur or some kind of feathers to keep them warm. Another detail that is often missing from these illustrations is that this dinosaur also had enormous eyes, which would have helped it see during the long Arctic nights. However, it might be logical that it slept for long periods of time during the harsh Arctic winters to conserve energy. Gasparinosaura had a rounded head that was moderately elongated. The eye sockets were very large and placed in a high position. The rather long back of the head was pendant. Because two fossils were discovered in close proximity to one another it's thought that it lived in herds. Some materials have been found in the gigantic footprints of Argentinosaurus. Trinosaura was a fairly small ornithopod dinosaur that lived in Antarctica back before it became covered by snow and ice, not that much can be inferred about the lifestyle of Trinosaura due to lack of more complete remains. An interesting thing about Mudaburosaurus is that the teeth are suited more towards slicing rather than grinding like in many of its relatives, this led to early speculation that it might have supplemented its diet with meat, possibly by scavenging. It probably spent most of its time in a quadrupedal posture and on bipedal while running. The ability to switch between bipedal and quadrupedal postures as the situation dictated meant that it could potentially browse upon a wide variety of plant types. With Alterinus it shares a characteristic arched snout, it may have housed tissues to cool the blood, conserve water, or enhance the sense of smell. Alternatively, it may have facilitated communication through vocalization or visual display. Tenontosaurus is by far the most common vertebrate of its environment, its tail takes up more than half the total body length, this tail was supported by a network of strong tendons which ensured it was always carried erect off the ground, study suggests that these dinosaurs were able to reproduce before they were fully grown. Dryosaurus subsisted primarily on low-growing vegetation in ancient floodplains and had a horny beak and cheek teeth. 
The maximum adult size of Dryosaurus is difficult to estimate as all of the known specimens seem to represent animals that were still growing. It probably relied on its speed as a main defense against carnivorous dinosaurs such as Ceratosaurus. Camptosaurus is a relatively heavily built form, with robust hind limbs and broad feet, still having four toes. It was a low browser and supported itself in a quadrupedal fashion. It had a large amount of teeth in its mouth and these often show signs of heavy wear, this suggests that it had to do a lot of chewing in order to process its food properly, and may have focused on plants too tough for other species to tackle, and may have focused on plants too tough for other species to tackle. Iguanodon has a firm place within dinosaur history books, not just because of the large expanse of fossil material attributed to it, but because it was the second dinosaur to ever be identified. Its thumb spike is one of its best known features, this thumb is typically interpreted as a close-quarter stiletto-like weapon against predators. Early reconstructions of Iguanodon depicted it as tail dragger, but the tail is now always shown to be straight and carried high off the ground. Aranosaurus is well known to have a big sail on its back, this is believed to have been used to keep the animal cool during the hot days. It could do this by expelling heat through the sail. Other paleontologists believe that this wasn't the purpose of it at all, that it was used only for the dinosaur to attract a mate with. It didn't have any teeth in its bony beak, it did have teeth in its cheek. This would have allowed the dinosaur to grind a variety of plant material so it could easily digest it. Probactrosaurus was lightly built, with relatively long and slender arms and hands and only a small thumb spike. The most recognizable aspect of hadrosaur anatomy is the flattened and laterally stretched rostral bones, which gives the distinct duck bill look. The position Bactrosaurus occupies in the Cretaceous makes it one of the earliest known hadrosauroids, and although it is not known from a full skeleton, it is one of the best known of these forms of hadrosaur's predecessors. The relatively small size of Telmatosaurus has been explained as an instance of insular dwarfism. A juvenile specimen bears a large non-cancerous tumor called an amyloblastoma on its jaw. The discovery of an amyloblastoma in a dinosaur gives evidence that the development of benign tumors is a basal characteristic. Fukuosaurus was exceptional in that its skull was not kinetic, the tooth-bearing maxilla would be so strongly fused to the vomer that a sideways chewing motion would have been impossible. Longosaurus has been described as having astonishingly huge teeth, among the largest for any herbivorous creature ever, which indicate it was a styrocostern and iguanodont. The mandible suggests a very large size for the animal. Tooth was growing very rapidly. The hollow type of Hadrosaurus was found in marine sediments, which suggests the skeleton was transported by a river and then deposited in the Cretaceous Sea. One of the things that the genus is famous for is that it was the first dinosaur to have a skeleton mounted for public display in 1858. The discovery of Acrostavus is paleontologically significant because it supports the position that the ancestor of all hadrosaurids did not possess cranial ornamentation, and that ornamentation was an adaptation that later arose interdependently in the subfamilies Sauraulophina and Lamiosaurinae. The name Maeosaura refers to the find of nests with eggs, embryos and young animals, in a nesting colony. These showed that it fed its young while they were in the nest, the first time such evidence was obtained for a dinosaur. 
Studies of the stress patterns of healed bones showed that young juveniles under four years old walked mainly bipedal, switching to a mainly quadrupedal style of walking when they grew larger. They appeared to have no defense against predators, except perhaps, their herd behavior. Brachylophosaurus was quite unique amongst other hadrosaurs, one identifying feature is the flat crest on top of the skull, but there seems to be two different versions with some individuals having crests that were much smaller than others. One theory to explain this is sexual dimorphism where males presumably had larger crests than females for display purposes. Because of a current lack of fossils for this genus, the only thing that can be said with any certainty is that Kerberosaurus was a Sauralophene hadrosaurid, the group of hadrosaurs noted to have solid head crests. Eugrunolic was one of the most northern living hadrosaurs that we currently know about, and grew to a fairly large size. Like other sauralophenes, Eugrunolic had no kind of bony head crest, however, in life Edmontosaurus had a fleshy soft tissue crest like growth on its head. It is unknown if Eugrunolic had a similar display device. While in the Cretaceous Alaska was cooler than the tropical latitudes, it was still much warmer than it was today. Predatory dinosaurs such as Trudonts may have been a particular danger to Eugrunolic. Shantungosaurus is one of the largest known ornithischians, a large hole near its nostrils may have been covered by a loose flap of skin, which could be inflated to make sounds. It might have done this to attract a mate or to ward off other males in intraspecies contests that likely arose between competing males. Edmontosaurus shares the same characteristic, this last dinosaur was probably nomadic and may have even traveled in large herds for protection from the apex predators of their day. Extensive bone beds are known for Edmontosaurus, and such groupings of hadrosaurids are used to suggest that they were gregarious. It was widely distributed across western North America. Its distribution fossils suggests that it preferred coasts and coastal plains. Prosaurolophus had several potential methods for display in a social setting. The bony facial crest is an obvious candidate, and nasal diverticula may also have been present. These postulated diverticula would have taken the form of inflatable soft tissue sacs housed in the deep excavations flanking the crest and elongate holes for the nostrils. Such sacs could be used for both visual and auditory signals. Griposaurus is similar to Critosaurus, and for many years the two were thought to be synonyms. It is known from numerous skulls, some skeletons, and even some skin impressions that show it to have had pyramidal scales projecting along the midline of the back. It is most easily distinguished from other duckbills by its narrow arching nasal hump, sometimes described as similar to a Roman nose, and which may have been used for species or sexual identification. Nipponosaurus is classed as a lamiosaurine hadrosaurid because of the hollow head crest that rises up from the top of the snout. Syntosaurus is actually not known by many individuals, the popularity of Syntosaurus is all down to the forward pointing crest that adorns the top of the skull, there was one widespread speculation that this crest was simply a product of the fossilization process, and that the bone that made up the crest was actually from somewhere else. Parasaurolophus was a large bipedal quadrupedal herbivore, eating plants with a sophisticated skull that permitted a grinding motion analogous to chewing. 
Its teeth were continually being replaced, they were packed into dental batteries containing hundreds of teeth. Many hypotheses have been advanced as to what functions the cranial crest of Parasaurolophus performed, but most have been discredited. It is now believed that it may have had several functions, visual display for identifying species and sex, sound amplification for communication, and thermoregulation. Charonosaurus from China, which may have been its closest relative, had a similar skull and potentially a similar crest. Lamiosaurines have narrower beaks than hadrosaurines, implying that Charonosaurus and its relatives could feed more selectively than their broad-beaked, crestless counterparts. Lamiosaurus had a distinctive crest on the top of its head. Its nasal cavity ran back through this crest, making it mostly hollow. Many suggestions have been made for the function or functions of the crest, including housing salt glands, improving the sense of smell or acting as a resonating chamber for making sounds. Was quite similar to Corythosaurus in everything but the form of the head adornment. The Corythosaurus crest resembles the crest of the cassowary, a specimen has been preserved with its last meal in its chest cavity. Inside the cavity were remains of conifer needles. The discovery of tooth marks in the fibula of a Hypacrosaurus specimen inflicted by a bite from the teeth of a Tyrannosaurid indicated that this, and other hadrosaurids were either preyed upon or scavenged by large theropod. Unlike the situation in North America, where lamiosaurines are virtually absent from late Maastrichtian rocks, Asian lamiosaurines like Oloratitan are diverse and common at the end of the Mesozoic, suggesting climatic or ecological differences. <laughs>